This is for the nerds, this is for the brainiacs, this is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back, you ain't gonna touch me, you not gonna do nothing, you are not above me, I bet you wish you was me, I know that I know. This is for the nerds, this is for the brainiacs, this is what we deserve. Go ahead and play it back, I know that I know. This is my chair forever, and this is uh, your chair. <laughs> sure, sure. It is your chair forever until you know it's not. Nick will never be on season two. <laughs> Nick will never be Wait, on is season. that a hard commitment that for the next 50 weeks? 50? I eternity. mean, eternity. Eternity. You will just be here physically. I didn't say that. I said Nick is banned. Not that I'll be here physically, but, you know, we'll see what happens. We're not canceling shows on your behalf, man. Neither. I understand. I'm just saying that Nick stole my flag on season one, and he's no longer welcome on the show. You can't <laughs> steal the Dominican flag and be back what on the show. What happened to that thing? Exactly. Exactly. He took it to the fucking mountain with his mushrooms. <laughs> okay? God damn. Sure. He probably, like, like put the flag and laid on it. Like this motherfucker. Never again. Never again. <laughs> All right. Picnic on the flag. We have a lot of topics today. Yeah. They are going to get deep and they're going to get, uh, they're going to be interesting. I'm Maybe as see. spicy as that intro, man. I'm feeling that new music. You like the intro? Yeah. I saw it. It was nice. I like <laughs> They had me flexing there. They were, yeah. they weren't pussing around. Yeah. A lot of, a lot of chin flex going on. I like it though. You know, a lot of people are used to like you flexing all the time. Like I see you like when you. When you're like on the stream, I feel like you like do a little bit of this just like while you're in the while you're moving the mouse a little bit. Right. Just to like right. promote yourself. Yeah, that's definitely what happened. The hundred first dates. You're like, yeah, I was on a hundred first dates. Mm -hmm. Just saying that. All right. So talking about stream, you didn't stream this week and you won a tournament. Sure. That's fucked up. That is a little messed up. I've won all my money off stream. <laughs> it's not fair. Like the people are committed to you. And you just, you let them down. They're just like, wow, I didn't get to see you. And it was a big tournament. It was a huge tournament. You know, it was ironic. Yesterday, I was there while you were winning this tournament. And it was like the first time I seen you like a little bit animated, like trying to like, you know. Bro, like, you were really <laughs> they didn't want to give it to me, man. I came in, I think I had a slate chip lead heads up to start. Mm. I think I was like one and a half to one to start. And then uh, lost a couple big pots, whatever. I was in a three to one chip deficit four different times and it was just so difficult to to stomach because it was like one of those things where you know i'd win my all in to get even and then i'd run a three barrel that should just work and doesn't doesn't work yeah and then you just fail and then i would get slightly edge again winning my all in and then like lose a flip and it's just like this is so unbearable because we're playing for eleven thousand dollars like it's a huge discrepancy between first and second yeah and moreover, I just don't win tournaments. I always get second. But so far, I've won two off stream, zero on stream. That's how it works, man. You most of, it, It's what you do when people aren't watching that really counts. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like, are you putting in the work off when the cameras aren't on? You know, the weights and the, sure. you know, yeah, you've yeah. heard that phrase before. Yeah, except this is, I think, a little bit more just like luck related. Okay, well, touche. All right, well, after this, the end of this month, we go into another homeschool. Next Monday. It's like, do you like time off? Do you enjoy? Like, I'm good, man. I just had a 60k week. I uh, I'm ready to to That's it. take the next six months away. Yeah, like let's just hang it up. Let's shift back to the business. You know, we made our money in poker. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man. Ah, <sighs> all right. Well, if people do want to sign up, this is we're coming into crunch time. Yep. This is it. Sign up now or forever hold your peace. Yes, sir. Um, and then uh, we'll be another month of homeschool, and then after that, we'll 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 be off, right? Yeah, I I'm I'm stating this with conviction. I'm not running another homeschool after this one. Okay, I'm just the, making sure. The uh, I guess like so we did a survey to see if people were interested in us doing it again, like for everybody who missed out on the first iteration, and yada yada yada, and we got like pretty overwhelming support. I think like we had about a hundred people answer. And something like 75 were interested in the course. Yeah. That hasn't exactly panned out. 
It's like when you DM a girl and like you think she's kind of interested, but then it doesn't really pan out. It's like you know she kind of gives you the number and then right. like, you kind of hit her up, but then she like right takes like a day little, two it's just ghosted. She takes a little longer to like respond, and then you're like, hey, what you doing? And then she's like, mm, you know, it takes a little longer. Like, all, every text takes like an extra fifteen minutes to get mm-hmm. through, and then you really you realize that it doesn't. I mean, I'm just talking about my friends, not me, but like you know. right, right. So you've heard. So I've heard. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of the. Th- it, I don't think we're ever going to have another situation where people just have that amount of free time where they can all collectively get together. And it just doesn't make sense for us to dedicate a month to something that is only going to serve like 10 or 15 or 20 people. Mm. Okay. Let's get to the shits, man. Too much of this Berkey winning money. I've won money too. I'm just on the low. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a cheating scandal going on. Rumor. Allegedly. Well, you know, some people have admitted to some things. Let's see. So first... Let's give the whole backstory of how this even began, right? Out of nowhere, Bill Perkins just like fires off a tweet, right? Late at night. Yeah. Everybody's ready to go to bed. It was like 11. It was like, it was like, it's pretty late. And he just fires off a street, uh, 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 a tweet saying, cheating scandal. Gonna put Mike Postle, nothing. It's nothing. It's like church, right. church service, he right. says. <laughs> I don't know about you, but church service is nice. I think I think he made a very fair comparison. I think that uh, Mike Postle's cheating scandal does actually look like church because specifically the Catholic church is riddled with scandal. That's fair. I mean, I've gone to church and they bring the little basket around. You got to throw your money in there. That's kind of like Mike Postle right there. Yeah. yeah it's like, yeah. hey, listen, I'm coming around. Throw your little money in here. We'll see you next time. <laughs> you know? Shit, yeah, man. I, I probably lost a couple bucks in that, in that church. Mm-hmm. All right, so he fires off that tweet. Everyone's going crazy. Like, it's like, it's literally just everyone's like, what's going to happen? Everyone with the popcorn gifts, you know, just like, oh my God, oh my God, whatever. Comes out next day, it's like not that crazy, right? Like, he's like, oh, I'm not going to talk about it, blah, blah, blah. He's like, you know, with my, my deal with the person, you know, I'm not really at liberty to say. And then my man, Kind of like my man, but not really my man. Like, <laughs> like, like Dan Blitz was just like, fuck it. Like, I'm just going to come out and say it. This cocksucker <laughs> fucking cheated me and Blitz, and we played on the fun ocean poker app. Yeah. And then he put his fucking picture in there. He almost put his phone number, but then he like held back a little bit. I would have fucking blown the phone number too. He did. The first tweet, he deleted it. It had the phone number. <laughs> wow. That's crazy. Yeah. So he fires it off. And now everybody's like, oh, shit, like, this is crazy. Like, this guy, like, really cheating, whatever. And then now we know it's Jungle, right? And now everybody's like, oh, shit, like, this isn't the first time Jungle's actually cheated or, like, things like that. So let's pause there, right, before we get into the whole Jungle thing. We have an app. We already kind of spoke about this stuff, like, the apps and, like, shady business. But this is different. This is not the app's problem. This is actually like online poker, right? Yep. So Jungle Man is ghosting this cocksucker dude. Sure. Right? Sure. Okay. And he's cheating Blitz and Perkins out of money. Cheating Mm -hmm. via ghosting. Sure. So ghosting could go in a couple different ways. Ghosting could go into like I'm sitting next to you and telling you what to do. Or I'm on Skype with the screen share. Or, like, I got you on the phone and, like, whatever. Like, any way where Jungle is telling the cocksucker to do what to do. Yeah. Right? Okay. I don't even know. I don't remember his name. His name's Cocksucker. No. <laughs> okay? Sure. Okay. So, let's talk about that first. Because mm-hmm. that, there's a lot of people that view it two different ways. They're like, you're online. There's no way to enforce that. That's chill. The other side is, that's blatantly cheating. Because I'm not playing against the person that I'm supposed to be playing against. So let's pause there. I'll get your take on it. And then I'll kind of say what I say. Sure. Um, all right. So I think that the the best way to frame this argument in any sort of good faith is to just lay out as much of the factual information that we have without choosing sides. So starting with ghosting as a whole. Does it occur in the online arena? Yes. Does it occur often? Yes. Yeah, but difficult to know to what degree. Yeah. Uh, I think it's much more rampant in general in MTTs mm-hmm. than it is in cash. 
But this dates all the way back to pre-Black Friday, right? Like there are a lot of poker's heroes today that people forget about that used to buy accounts mm -hmm. when they were deep in the Sunday million and, uh, you know, basically just like pay ICM or some variation thereof yeah. in order to uh, have a shot at big scores. So this isn't anything new from that regard. Now, if we compare that to um, the moral code of, of ethics, does that make it okay? So because it exists and it exists at somewhat scale, does that then make it justifiably okay? From my vantage point, it's, it's, it's as gray of an answer as it is of a question, right? Like, do I think that it's ever okay to, uh, to be on the side of ghosting or whatever? By the letter of the law, no. But by practicality, of course, almost everybody through the come up from 2003 until now has been in a situation where a friend was deep and it turned into a collective mm -hmm. brain trust or a friend needed to take a shower while they were six tabling and somebody else stepped in. Yeah. Like this is just super, super commonplace. And largely speaking, that probably doesn't impact the EVs of that specific person nor the collective group that they're playing against that much. I think this particular instance, it's the specif specific, uh, it's the specifics of the matter mm. that, uh, really dictate like why this should be considered worse than it probably is. Okay. Right, let me pause you there. Okay. Because I want to get you. You're like, you're digging into juggle man's kind of, uh, like rebuttal. Defense, right? Yeah. So let's, let's actually pull up jungle man's defense first. Okay. Um, okay. So jungle is he's gonna he's gonna fire off a tweet now today actually mm -hmm. and he effectively says like hey um i feel as if everyone's doing this i feel like i've been unfairly charged i've been playing against other whales vips that clearly have pros behind them mm -hmm. because of the way they play and he's right. probably a pretty good identifier of pro professional poker play right yep. then he says I'd like to thank Nick Schulman for having my back saying, you know, free jungle and also saying like that he accepts the apology of the people that accused him of having, you know, an immoral code. Right. Nick Schulman fires off and says, I think this whole thing is funny. Like we're acting as if like there's not an excessive amount of this already happening. It's not like we're talking about like fake card shufflers or like you know, excessive swapping, things like that. Like, this is all, like, pretty much hypocrisy. Like, this is all a fucking joke, pretty much he's saying. <sighs> That's a lot. It's a lot to unpack. Like, it's like, Jungle's saying everyone's doing it. Nick is saying you're all hypocrites because you're doing it too. And you're all just, like, letting Jungle Man fall under the bus. Well, first of all, I don't think Jungle's really experienced very much backlash. I was, I forget who I was talking to today, but if this were Bonomo, instead of jungle, if Bonomo were the face of this, he would be absolutely crucified. Mm -hmm. Like there would just be no forgiving him uh, amongst the community because he's a much more polarizing figure and he already has a past of multi-accounting. So it's just like one of those things where we're tolerant to the point of the level at which we like the person who's being accused. As far as like Nick and jungle's stance, I can get behind it a little bit in the sense of if you have empirical proof that there are no innocent bystanders, then yeah, of course, what you're saying is true. But like Jungle admitted in his own apology that he did play against Bill and Bill obviously doesn't have anybody super using his account. Right. So it's just like, uh, you and I were kind of talking off the air about this. It's, it's an unfair stance to take to say everybody else is doing it. So we're just going to do it and we're going to do it better when there are clear innocent bystanders who are losing the bulk of the EV. So even if on this app, it's say seven handed, Mm -hmm. And five whales are hiring pros to play on their account or to ghost their account in some sort of capacity. But there are two that just aren't because they don't realize that this is a thing. They are just operating on good faith that they're playing against five peers, right? Remember how this group was constructed. Mm -hmm. It's all businessmen who have some sort of affinity for poker and believe that they're operating on fair grounds. Yeah. And some of those businessmen, men, men, took it upon themselves to try to carve out an unfair advantage, right? Right. For those who acted in good faith, they are taking the blunt of the punishment. 
right? Mm -hmm. So for every Perkins in the group, the, the collective of bad actors are praying, right? He'll never win in that environment. Now, short term, he said he did win, and that's good that he found out when he did. Otherwise, he may have been lambasted. Word. But who knows how many others like Perkins were the ones being taken advantage of. And so this is what it all comes back to. When the the idea of it's being proposed to Jungle, it had to have happened in one of two magnitudes of order. Either he was the first one to breach the, the ghosting protocol, right? So either the quote-unquote cocksucker hmm. was the first one to say, yo, I can hire a pro and we'll just clean up. And Jungle saw it as a really fruitful opportunity to play a super soft game and have a piece. Or he was the last one to to be the 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 one to cross the the picket line, so to speak, right? Yes. Where the cocksucker comes to him and says, hey, everybody in this group has a pro playing for them. I'm sure you know about this. I'd like you to be my guy. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, it's a little bit easier for Jungle to parse morally because he thinks that he's operating on a fair playing field. But... This is where I think that the whole defense falls apart. If that were true, why would the quote-unquote cocksucker still want to be involved in that game? Where's the EV being derived from? Right. If you're just if you're basically having seven businessmen just stake seven pros and play against one another. Well, same reason that like these businessmen buy action in, you know, some tougher games of the pros. They just think their pros better than the other pro. I don't and think, I think, you know, Jungle Man's a pretty good player. Yeah, I agree with that part, but I don't think that, that is very right. I, I don't think that's ever the case. Right. He effectively thinks there's other VIPs that don't have a 100%. pro behind them. One hundred percent. There's a soft spot in the game. There's right. EV to be. Let me give you. Captured. Let me give you this other side. Right. Not saying jungles right. Not saying jungles wrong. But they are playing on a platform where this can't really be enforced. Effectively, if you're playing on WSOP.com, if you're playing on stars party gg anything like this they kind of have a history of your gameplay right yep. and when your gameplay deviates massively right it's going to put up some red flags well only wsop would really be preventive of this because you can't run any third-party software okay and that's, that's huge that's that's a really big deal but they probably have all the, they have all the hand histories they can, yeah, yeah, right. So that's that's a second layer of security. Correct. Right. So they can identify, like same way they identify, like chimp dumping or anything like this. When you move away from like drastic, like one day to the next, one hour to the next, you're just like a completely different player. Mm -hmm. It's gonna put up some red flags. Like doesn't mean you're gonna get banned immediately, but your account's gonna start being watched. Right. Right. They're playing in a situation where there is no enforcement of this. Like, so now the other argument is like, well, we're playing in like a situation where these rules maybe don't apply. Like, I mean, I think that's just like a bit of a lazy argument where it excuses bad actors, mm -hmm. right? Like somebody has to take the moral high ground and try to do their best. And the fact of the matter is they had protocols in place to try to prevent this. They had a webcam on everybody. Yeah. Right. So imagine that the, the second you make the hard decision, of I'm going to go around the security protocols in place. Yeah. Albeit weak ones. Right. The second you make that decision, you are openly acting deviously in order to deceive somebody out of their money. Yeah. And yeah. if you want to go the route of like, that's what poker is, fine. But not to me. Mm. Like, that's not the purity of the game. You know, it's it's not about shaking somebody down at all costs. And I get it. That's the old school mentality. You know, guys like Doyle were rounding whenever people were getting their heads shot off. Yeah. And somehow that was like, you know, an acceptable, but we've moved past that. And I'm all for the gambler's mindset. That's, that's where I think we are in a weird, like fork in the road. Mm -hmm. Right. I think there are people like that view poker as a business, right? There are people that view poker as a business, the pros. And then there are people that view poker as a hustle. Mm -hmm. Right. And they're just like, well, this is a hustle. Like this is a hustle game. Like, so if you view poker as a business, and even in business, things like this occur. Sure. But like, you know, now we have like, okay, we're all playing under the same grounds. And like, you know, it's an exchange of, of, of thought competition, yeah. right? Then there's the people that view this as a hustle. And it'll never leave that because that's where it was built from. Right. So what do you say to that group? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing we can really do except to attempt to police it. But uh, I think that like... At the end of the day, what needs to happen is the people who are giving away, giving up the most 
need to be the ones to take the biggest stands. So the guys who are losing in that game need to be the one to step back and say, like, I'm not going to try to level the playing field. I'm just going to take my ball and go home. Mm. And I think that's really critical because the fact of the matter is, like, yeah, we can simplify this as much as possible and say, like, ghosting occurs. It's not that big of a deal. Um, we all know this going into the platforms that we're playing on, yada, yada, yada. But the next step to this is real-time assistance. This isn't that far removed. Mm -hmm. a, a, a well to do businessman who's not very good at poker, having jungle man control his mouse, isn't that far off from having jungle man, having a real time solve run in the background. Yeah. Right. And if that's the way we're going to progress, then everything I've been saying about online poker up until this point of it's an apocalyptic landscape that has absolutely no future is going to come to fruition way faster than anybody's willing to acknowledge. And the whole reason why this isn't talked about more often and why it kind of gets swept under the rug is because of this hard divide where so many of the winners online just view it as a dog eat dog world. Yeah. They see the losers as expendable, right? And it's just a matter of vacuum up as much money and as much EV as you can in the short run until this whole thing collapses underneath us. Do you think the VIP entry to poker has kind of created this problem? Whereas like, before all the games were open, before you just go to Bellagio and you fucking sit and you play. Now we have these VIPs, these games get shut off. Jungle Man, this is probably the only way he could get into this game. It's creating a weird problem where like, it seems like the way to get into big games is now to either bring a VIP yourself, be not one of the best pros, or be a hired gun. It's just not a meritocracy, man. Like this, this is all big business. There's a lot of hoops and red tape that you have to jump through to get a seat at the big table. And like, none of us are entitled to it. And yeah, it's an unfair landscape. It's, it's not something where you just get to sharpen one tool or even a, a collection of tools and just know someday that that's going to translate into your big payoff. That's not fair, right? Like if we want to look at this like business, let, let, we want to look at this like business. If you have the best product, you're going to you're going to win, right? That's not looking at it like business. That's like looking at it as a demand, as just sheer and utter product demand, mm -hmm. right? There's a huge difference between product and business. Yeah. Like yes, the best product will win, yes. but the biggest business will destroy that product or buy it or buy it, which is what just happened or duplicate it or whatever the case may be. Right. So business isn't fair either. It's not a yeah. meritocracy. Right. 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 Money speaks. And that's unfortunate. It creates a very unlevel playing field. And I understand that there's a lot of desire to do, you know, less than ethical things in order to give yourself a seat at that table. But at some point you have to wake up and look yourself in the mirror and say like, how much am I willing to continually bend? Mm -hmm. Because where this actually may not be, that black and white of an issue, there will be more opportunity down the line that will press your moral compass further and further and further to the point where you're just like, I'm willing to do anything for money. Yeah, man. It feels it feels like we're in a weird time where the the entry of this like VIP kind of thing has like warped the high stakes into a private ground where like the people outside are doing anything they can to get in. Like, effectively now, like, it's gotten to a point where, like, you don't even know if these people that are inviting you to these games are actually your friends or they're, like, the only way they could get in is because they're, like, they're inviting you. You know what I mean? Yeah. You shouldn't care about that. All that you should care about is game integrity. And the issue is, is that's... Well, I'm saying, like, I think there's a lot of people that are networking, making believe they're friends with these people. Right. And then, like, just, you know, slaughtering. Yeah, I understand. I'm just saying, like, that that doesn't... There's no harmful effect to that. Like at the end of the day, all you should care about is game integrity. And that's far easier to police live than it is online. Mm. And, you know, there's just a myriad of reasons why live is so protected and has a strong future and why online looks so apocalyptic. And it's not to say that online has to go by the, the wayside and eventually become dystopian. But it is to say that if we don't take some sort of action to correct the course that we're on, Online only has a dystopian future. Do you think it's gotten faster through the apps and through the private browser games? I think the fact that like this community is giving credence to these apps is just a fast track to nowhere. 
I mean, we are just creating third party entities every single day that are sheer and utter money grabs that are like smash and grab operations, right? They have no business plan or platform that has any desire of withstanding the long term. So they are literally just coming in, trying to pluck out as much capital from this community as humanly possible under shady metrics, not giving a shit about security, not giving a shit about ecosystem or player pool or anything along those lines and just doing their damnedest to serve a need, which is giving people a platform to gamble on mm -hmm. in an instance where they are too emotionally driven to care about the things that really matter. I think that brings up a good question though, in terms of the reason why they're going here is because one, they're getting a piece of the rake, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're game runners, yep. getting a piece of the rake. They get to control who's in and who's out. They pretty much like set all the rules, right? Should a live environment cater to this, give them a piece of the rake, do, do these kind of things. I don't to think kind of bring to, bring a competition kind of thing. I don't think they need to. I think that only becomes the discussion if home games start triumphing over uh, like casino driven games. Mm -hmm. But the security element of it is just so great that the casino just offers infinitely more for a very low cost, right? Yeah. Like the rake is just very small when you start playing big and the security that you have, knowing that you're effectively operating through a bank, right? Like, let's be honest, at the end of the day, that's what a casino functions as. Mm -hmm. Your money is safe there. You know you'll be paid. Uh, you have immediate game integrity because there's no foreign chips. There's no operating on credit. There's so many hoops and bells and whistles that become problematic in the home game environment that are just handled right out of the gate at the casino environment. And yeah, you might lose some fish along the way, but the reality is the people that you lose are the most likely to be bad actors that will screw the, the books at the end of the day anyway. We call them VIPs, Berkey. We call them VIPs. Anyway, I want to get into a little bit of a different top talking point now. It's been a tumultuous week, to say the least. It's been probably, you know, we haven't seen a week like this in a couple of years, you know, maybe since like Ferguson, et cetera. And I wanted to open up with a video and, you know, then we could kind of discuss about it a little bit of like a privilege video. Yeah. yeah, it's been pretty popular, you know, on Instagram, things like that. So let's cut to that video and then let's kind of talk about it. All right. We are, we are racing for a hundred dollar bill. So they're racing. The winner of this race will take this. A hundred dollar bill. Before I say go, I'm going to make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward and both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I have said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish 
to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. Because the reality is, if this was a fair race and everybody was back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly going to win this race called life. That is a picture of life, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now. When I say go. This is the craziest part right here, I think. Get set. Go. All right. So, if you didn't learn anything from some of the activity, you're a fool. Some of the crazy part about that video is like, you know, as you know, some of the some of the white kids are moving forward, like. They're having a pretty good time. Like they're just like kind of smiling. Like you know, if you replay the video, they're kind of smiling. They don't really. They're not even sure what what's happening right now. Yeah. Like, but if you look at the minority kids in the back, like they're not having a great time. Like simply put, like it's not fun. Like they're seeing. No, nah, man, that was that was powerful. Like just listening to the prompts, like I wouldn't have taken a step. Right. And like that's that's a really isolating feeling when you're. 12 13 15 17 even you know what i mean it's like even though those kids can share that experience amongst each other compared to the group they're massive minorities for sure and there's so much embarrassment and i guess uh just acknowledgement that the world's against you that you don't want to share that experience with other people no absolutely not right absolutely not and you know, I want to preface this segment, you know, before we even get, we're getting into some other topics. Like, like you, like you said, like you wouldn't have taken a step. So it's not like, like grouping you into like white privilege. It, that doesn't, that doesn't account. Obviously no, it you're does. like, you're like a white male that, you know, that's a privilege in and of itself. But like you didn't, right. like your steps forward weren't massively ahead of anybody else's. Well, it's, there, there is a veil of context that's necessary, right? Because... I wouldn't have taken a step forward for any of those prompts. Mm -hmm. But if we kept digging deeper, right, there's right. a lot of things that I'm just born into Correct. that give me unfair advantages. Correct. So, I mean, like we're all, and, and, you know, to that degree, it's like there are things that those underprivileged kids, if you change the wording a little bit, they now get advantages, but they just don't, they don't appear that way, right? It takes somebody illuminating it to understand, like, you know, if you, if you signify the prompt, like, uh, have you ever struggled to the point that it allowed you to become tougher? Well, yeah, or, but that's right. But that's still like coming from behind. Like, right. Yeah, yeah, it, no, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. But that victory means something. It means more. Right. Right. But personally. Yes. Right. Right. Not, yeah, 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 not yeah. exactly. It's something to build off of. I guess what I'm getting, I'm, I'm not trying to, to say that those prompts were, were jaded or, or skewed in any one way. I'm just saying that like, uh, I think that for me specifically, even though I wouldn't have taken a step forward in that particular grouping, mm -hmm. I still would have had a lot of born in advantages. Correct. Like I know my grandparents, I'm yeah, taken yeah. care of by them. Right? right. Right. Maybe the others I'm surrounded by aren't. Of course. Uh, agreed. Like effectively you can keep prompting and eventually you'll take a step forward, yeah, but yeah, yeah. they probably also know their grandparents and they like, they, sure. they would keep taking steps forward. Yeah. And what I find pretty deep is that, the race actually like that is what happens like yeah, the yeah. race runs through life and like right. you see these people like trying to catch up like you yeah. see you know the black guy in the back like trying really hard to like catch up and that actually that's actually what happens so like you know a lot a lot of people in the chat were saying like oh this video is like seven years old like yeah that's even that's even worse right like, the fact that it's seven years old and we're like it relates today it's even worse that this is this is still a thing right yeah so you know i wanted to even bring that up and actually give you know, a little bit of like landscape to like what we're about to talk about. And obviously like, 
you're a white male, so at least giving you the ability to say like, hey, like it's not like I was born to privilege and like giving you the ability to, you know, talk and, and stuff like that. But I do want to talk about what happened in well, first I want to talk about what happened in the gym in Michigan yeah. first, uh, with Tom Austin. Okay. And we could kind of talk about that. Like there was some prejudice that happened there. So let's roll the clip with Tom Austin in the gym in Michigan. What'd you say we can't do? I'm Tom Austin. I'm okay. a tenant in the building. Okay. Are you? We're all tenants in this building. What for? Don't worry about that. We don't have to say anything. What office? So we have an office here, and this guy came accusing us we can't be here. What yeah. office are you in? That don't worry matter. about that. We don't have to tell you anything. Call 911 now. Go ahead. As you guys can see, we're dealing with racism here. Y'all see this racism here? All right. So don't appear to be part of the gym. Yeah. Or so this occurred in a WeWork office building. Mm -hmm. So if you know about WeWork, effectively how it functions is these companies rent out a space in a building and they they effectively rent that space mm -hmm. and that's why it's called we work you know long story short they're like they're like going bankrupt like they effectively got rid of their ceo um gave them like billions of dollars to just like get rid of them they're spot they're uh you know backed by softbank which is like one of the biggest uh investment firms in like the planet coming out of asia anyway so tom austin calls the police on these guys saying they don't really belong here. What's your take there? Because it seems like that's just like clearly just prejudice. Like it, I don't understand. Like he's, yeah. he's effectively saying like, it seems as if you're not, you don't belong here based on what exactly. Well, all right. So I think there's a lot of things going on here and obviously I'm, I'm just adding my own particular nuances as an observer. I have no idea what this guy is thinking. Mm -hmm. Of course. I mean, it's insanity to, to even get to the point where, you're in a public place and feel the obligation to rid the the premise of other people, period. Like, regardless of race, creed, color, sex, whatever, right? Like, it's insane that you have such a high level of elitism that you think to yourself, this is strange that there's six other people here and I don't want them here. And something about them tells me they don't belong here. Like, even if he were right, right? Like, let's let's go down that thought experiment really mm. quickly. Let's say this was just some, like, city youth that found their way into the gym to steal a workout. Yeah. We've all done it. I sneak people into the gym all the time. Nobody right. questions this because they're, like, white females, mm -hmm. right? But, like, even if that were the case, who cares? Right. Like, why is his impulse to not share but instead instead to hoard? And to effectively say, like, this is mine, not yours. Yes. You have to you have to be gone. The fact that he says, like, it seems like you don't belong here or what floor do you come from? Yeah. Like, if this was the truth of the matter is, like, if this was a white person, he would never say, like, what floor are you from or well, like anything like that. Like, I want to add a, a, a touch of nuance to that where I, I largely agree that it's because they're minorities, but I also think it's because they're youths. Yeah. Right. So it's a business building. Correct. So like if they were if they were 60 year old black men, I don't think it's the nece I don't necessarily think it's the same confrontation. Okay. But and, and just like if it were like 22 year old white guys, I think that there's still going to be a confrontation. I don't think the cops get called. Right. Right. But I think that this is as much uh, elitism as it is racism or or ageism, even to some degree. Right. Right. I mean, he, he's part of like F2. Uh, venture, which is a which is a venture capitalist firm, mm -hmm. right? Did wasn't a good week for them. Wasn't necessarily a good week for them. I, you know, I found their page, and I do want to play his partner's voicemail. Okay. So he put his phone number on on there on on their business page. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, let's play it. Let's see uh, what he has to say. Hi, this is Ian Herman. 
I'm no longer associated with F2 group or with Mr. Tom Austin. His actions are not right, and I don't want you to assume that I have the same beliefs. Sorry, mailbox is full. To send an SMS notification, press 5. I mean, that's one way to make a public statement. I mean, I'm sure he got a lot of phone calls and a Obviously. lot. And a, <laughs> mailbox is full. I'm not sending him a text message. What do you guys want me to say? Um, yeah, man. Clearly, I I think we're just like getting to a point where it seems very prejudiced. Like, clearly, he thinks like a minority, a, a black minority that's young, should prop shouldn't be here. Yeah, effectively. And I think that's that's a really big problem. I mean, I want to frame an argument that I think is going to cascade through everything that we talk about from this point forward, because I don't want to lean specifically on this being a racist issue, because I think that there are other systemic racist issues that are much more obvious. Mm -hmm. I think that, like, like I said, I think that this is an ageist issue. I think it's an elitist issue. I think that there are all these things at play here that could have led to this confrontation. And the fact that they're black on top of it just was the icing on the cake. What I want to talk about is this desire for tribalism and the need to have an enemy, mm -hmm. right? So effectively, as we have, I guess, uh, evolved throughout the, the centuries as a human race, we've been tribal by nature throughout the entire course of it all, right? It was a means of protection. It was a means of, uh, you know, developing... Uh, basically security, right? If you, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it was a way of facilitating food, shelter, water, and, you know, basic social surroundings. And this was pretty much true for at least through the industrial revolution. Uh, obviously it became a lot less secular as modern, uh, societies advanced, but even in that regard, we just started to become secular in a different way. Like now we started aligning ourselves by our communities and those communities were largely driven by religion or race mm -hmm. or status or wealth or whatever the case may be. Right. And we haven't been deprogrammed from this desire of, uh, I guess I don't, I'm, I'm like lacking another word other than elitism, this belief that we are so unique and that there are, there's an extension of us that is uniquely similar and we should all collect together. And the byproduct of this that nobody really seems to address is the downside of tribalism is the need to compete against your, yes. your rival tribes. Right, of course. Right? You're all fighting for the same food, shelter, water, clothing, social mm -hmm. surroundings, et cetera, right? That's programmed into us as well. And it's showing now through racial biases, through religious biases, through... All of these areas, even to the point where it's getting to a, a, a very, I don't, I don't want to say disrespectful because I feel like it, it diminishes what we're talking about, but like we don't even have continuity between the generations anymore. Yes, right. right. We don't look to our elders anymore, uh, and and not that that group of kids did anything wrong, but the tone that they were using is certainly not a respectful one. And albeit the guy deserved zero respect. But my point is, is that guy probably encounters the same thing from 16 year old white kids mm -hmm. on the street that are, you know, shitting up his lawn or whatever the case may be. So his lawn, his lawn is probably gated. Fair, like, fair. What are his morning commute? Like yeah. anything that disrupts his day, you know what I mean? Right. If you look at it through his lens, the world is only his, mm -hmm. right? So like, I, I guess it's scary that we don't have a unified enemy. But we're to a point now in society where we should be able to develop what that worldwide evil is, right? And we just can't seem to get behind that one cause. And when you look at like social liber socially liberal people, that worldwide enemy is often going to be racism. It's often going to be poverty. It's often going to be, uh, you know, things that divide. Yes. Right? And the issue that we keep running into that's so systemic in nature is that the counterbalance to that is the capital side of things, the economic side of things, mm. right? Solving or, or I guess attacking that enemy, that collective enemy 
of lacking privilege, of lacking basic human needs, right, is cost. And there is this subset of people that put cost and economics above all. Well, yeah, I mean, let's just let's just be real. Like this country was built on people's back and those backs were not white. Right. So this is what happens is now a face starts to begin to form for both of these causes. When we're talking about fighting poverty, racism, elitism, all of these things, what do we then start to attach to that? It's the 1%. Right. Right. So now we start to a fight. We, we start to fight elite white males who have made it. And it doesn't matter the path through which they made it. Right. Bezos is as guilty as, as uh, Gates, who's as guilty as Zuckerberg, et cetera, et cetera, and on down the line. And, you know, to be, to be fair, I do think there's a sliding scale. I think guys like Mark Cuban are a great example mm -hmm. where they certainly align themselves far more for the cause. Right. And they're doing a lot more from the activist side of things. But the whole point I'm trying to make is we're still being tribal here. And though the collective majority can recognize we have all these evils that we want to fight and we should align ourselves by that direction, what they also recognize is that the people that they're truly fighting against are the governmental elite or the business elite, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that, that now becomes the face. So now their face that they're fighting, the evil they're fighting is the collective that's making their life hard. And that just gets shown through racism. It gets shown through capitalism to some degree. It gets shown, or crony capitalism at least, right. right? It gets shown through uh, elitism where you don't view people on the same playing field if they're not of the same net worth as you. And all these other myriad of biases that if we go all the way back to that original video you played, all of these guys and, and women or whatever that are well off forget how many big step forwards they got to take for free. We're going to keep going. We're going to keep playing videos. I'm in. There's uh, one more video we're going to play, and then we'll discuss the rest of uh, the rest of our talking points. If this is the video I think it is, I'm going to have a hard time watching it. I know. I tried, I tried twice last night to actually get through the full version. It was just hard. Well, this is the thing. Like, you know... Saw you know a lot of the chats interacting. I'm, I'm trying to interact as best I can, and you know there was there was one person that said like, oh, "All right, so when are we going to talk about poker?" It's like, listen, we already spoke about poker. Like, poker's done for the day. If you don't want to watch the rest of the podcast, have a nice night. But for now, we have real big problems to talk about because it's solve for why. We solve for why. <laughs> okay, spoke about poker. You got your you got your nut off. Now we're talking about real shit. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not not fucking around today, man. Not fucking around. Uh, the chat's really too. The chat's really interactive too. They like they really enjoy the topic. I, I I do need to play this video because this 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 video is really important, and this is the Minneapolis video of George Floyd, and this is going to talk about two different things. So we're going to talk about George Floyd and that situation, and then I'm going to contrast it to something else that happened. So let's play the video of George Floyd, and it's going to be a little bit graphic. So if you have your kids around, you know maybe maybe turn them away, but. Let's turn, let's play the video of George Floyd now. Bro, you got it down, man. Let him breathe, leave, man. My stomach hurts. My neck hurts. Everything hurts. Ah. Ah. They're gonna kill me. They're gonna kill me, man. Ah. Bro, with your feet on his head, man, you get off the ground. His nose is bleeding. Like, come on. Okay. So we didn't play the whole video because I didn't want to. <laughs> I, I, I can't, man. I, I mean, I sh whatever. We should all be exposed to it because it's a reality. Like that literally just happened. Yeah. So this is the crazy part about it is, you know, I came in and I was prepping for this podcast and I was with Andre and Andre's like, listen, I'm going to put you in this chokehold just for one second. I just want you to kind of feel for one second what George Floyd felt. Mm hmm. And me, you know, I'm preparing for this podcast. I'm ready. To, I'm like in character, you know, <laughs> you know, when like Jamie, Jamie Foxx, like he put the, the blinding glasses on for like a week. Yeah. I was like, all right, I got to feel what George Floyd felt. I'm not saying I, I'm feeling what George, but for one second. Right. And he put me in this, in this lock. And I'm telling you, man, I could not breathe. Like yeah. I was coughing. Like when he let me go, Yeah. I was like coughing. Like I couldn't breathe. And obviously he's like, he's an MMA, uh, you know, uh, jujitsu expert. And it's like, George Floyd 
had someone that probably weighs like 170 pounds on his neck, like just pressed. Yeah. And he's like, I can't breathe. I can't like everything hurts. He's not resisting arrest at that point. There was another video that came out kind of from the security cams showing that he did like he was never at no point was he resisting arrest. Right. Right. So it seems like we're con- constantly getting into this, you know, every couple of years, this seems to just come come up. Right. And the conversation I was having today with people was simply like. There was all this talk back in the day, like, oh, you know, it really doesn't happen. Like, you know, communities are just like blowing this up and all this stuff, you know. And there was some shit that like, you know, back in the day, there was stories like, oh, the Loch Ness Monster. Does that exist? You know, and then like racism. Does that exist? Well, the truth is the Loch Ness Monster definitely does not exist. But racism from what we're seeing on our phones is clearly not gone. Right. Um, I want to move this forward now. I don't think there's much to say besides the fact that like that cop is clearly like pushing the boundaries to say the least. I mean, there's something to be said in the way that we police this country and the way that I think the, I don't, I don't want to generalize, but it's really hard not to given how much we've seen come out in the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. But whatever's going on with training, right? There's this disassociation with human life and the magnitude of taking someone's human life. Like yeah. that is so beyond disturbing to me. You know, we watch movies all the time. They're gory, they're graphic. And honestly, like that was a clip, man. Like this no, I goes know. on this goes on for I know, I saw minutes it. and minutes yeah. and minutes and there's actually people like there saying like get off of him. He can't breathe. Right. Like, right. Or you're a coward, like all these things, like, and he's just like not moving, like right. he's like no. And then there's someone actually like guarding him, guarding the yeah. situation. And it's like at some point in the video, also, we get to a point where he just blacks out. Yeah, like oh, he dies. Right, he dies. He dies. Yeah. So why are you still on top of him? Like I don't understand. Like why are you still on top of him? This person clearly is no longer a threat. Like he's fucking dead. Yeah. Like. That's that's the part that I'm struggling with to understand. And that's why I bring it to training. It has to start with training, right? It, it just has to. Because I can't for the life of me comprehend how you could put yourself in a position. Like what emotions are running through your body? What adrenaline? Because let's be honest, like he's, he's regressing to his training at this point, right, right? right? This is a highly emotional situation. He's certainly not in a logical s- state of mind. Uh, either that or he's a sociopath. I'm, right. I'm speaking about the cop. Yeah. Right. So either he's a sociopath who has a badge and a gun, which is a problem in and of itself. It means we're not doing enough to test those that we bring into the force, or he's just completely devoid of logic at this point and is operating on sheer and utter emotion, meaning he's regressed to his training and his training saying to keep this guy down, mm. even if it means the threat of potentially killing a man in cuffs who is absolutely zero threat. So like for me, this is what I just can't wrap my head around. And it it reminds me of like when the internet was first becoming a thing Mm -hmm. in the early 2000s. I can remember people like used to watch these snuff films. Right, right. right? On Napster, you would would download it on Napster or whatever. I mean, yeah, I I just remember my friend like showing me this guy getting beheaded. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was a joke. And it was like, no, that just happened. And it was like, I... The, the the feeling that went through my body, I can't even begin to describe. It's like yeah. you just witnessed human life being drained from somebody. It's like the most precious commodity that we have in this entire world. And we just watched it disappear fleetingly from somebody else and just like don't even bat an eye at it. Like, it, it, I don't know, man. It's like one of the most sickening things I've ever seen in my entire life. Like the Eric Garner thing too, where yeah, they just yeah. choke him out until he dies. It's just like, I can't wrap my head around this. I... I I get it if it's a life and death situation for yourself, but when someone's pacified and you take it to the lengths of killing them, like, I don't know what goes on in someone's mind to go that white with rage. It was a forged check, man. That that's, that's what caused this whole thing. They, it wasn't even, at least not from what I wrote. I I heard that the store thought he was writing a bad check. Right. Right. They didn't even confirm. Yeah. Of course they can't confirm right now. Like, right. Yeah. That's really, that's really disturbing. And then now, you know, 
I texted you last night. I'm like, yo, Minneapolis is going crazy. Yeah. Like, like it's no joke up there right now. Like they're out in the street and I want to show what Minneapolis looks like. And then I want to contrast it to something mm. and then kind of show the differences. So let's play what Minneapolis is currently going through right now. Riots on the street. And let's play that clip. All right, so now they're getting tear gassed. Okay, so we saw two cops there holding AR 15s. The rest of them are holding uh, tear gas uh, guns. So effectively, we're just like dealing with like military cops at this point. Like it's just like military action like coming in. I want to contrast this um, with the protest that was happening in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Right. So Michigan had a little bit of a, you know, a little bit of an uproar. You know, they couldn't get haircuts because of the you know, the quarantine. Right. And I want to show a little bit of the photos out of that kind of back and forth. Uh, so let's play some of the photos out of Michigan where they were protesting because, you know, they were trying to take over Capitol Hill and just saying like, Hey, like we can't like get us out of this quarantine. I want to get a haircut. Right. So let's, let's, let's get that. Let's get that up. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to bring that up in one minute. Um, but first, let's let's talk a little bit about this Minneapolis thing. So, quick one minute. What is your take on them just using tear gas and things like that? I saw some photos, you know, kind of dating back to like when the cops would just like water hose people. Yeah, yeah. You know, pre. Uh, um, wow, I'm losing during during like like during know. segregation. Yeah. Correct. Um, I guess I'd need to know the order of events better, mm -hmm. right? Because like the way it was demonstrated in that video, it seemed that the crowd had at least turned somewhat violent. Already. Yeah. At that point. Right. So like, that's what I, I, I don't, th this is a chicken egg dilemma, right? Was it peaceful protest? And then the cops initiated tear gas or was it violent protest? And then the cops responded, right? Well, almost never. It's just like immediately violent protest. It's like yeah. violent protest. But, I mean, and, and then if there was going to be a case of it, like correct. this, this, the Rodney King beatings, like these are, racially charged issues yeah, absolutely. where there was an injustice done to a specific person and a specific group. Mm -hmm. So like for those groups to respond violently, it wouldn't like overly shock me, I guess. Correct. Correct. I, I just don't know is what I'm saying. Well, you know, that community is saying we, we, we protest and you don't listen. Mm -hmm. So we riot. Right. And I could see that argument in that, this isn't the first protest of this of this thing. And, and the reason I want to go to the the Michigan protest is because there is such a big disparity between those those two like organizations. Yeah. yeah. Right. So let's try to cut back to the Michigan uh photos and and potentially videos uh and and, and ready to go. So we're gonna we're gonna cut to the Michigan video now. So this is the Capitol building. Okay. So do we have some photos as well? I don't I don't wanna Yeah, we can find some photos. Um okay. So they pretty much invaded the Capitol building. 
there's a couple of major photos that have been going around um, that we'll try to bring up as well. And effectively, it's like two different, two different, completely different things. Yeah. Where it's like what we're noticing, at least as a trend, is that when it's like a racial kind of divide and we're kind of fighting for that, things get like escalated yeah. quickly. Yeah. yeah. Right. When it's, I want to do these things and these people happen to be white, it seems as if there is no uh, harsh reaction from law enforcement. Like, what we saw there right. is, like, these people are in their face in the Capitol building saying, like, let us in. Like, we're taking over. And what you're going to see as well is, like, th these people were, like, open carrying, like, yeah. huge guns like that part you know that's why i want to bring up those photos is like they're in their face yelling with guns like if we put this and transcribe it to what's happening in minneapolis obviously two different situations but like these people that were riding and things they weren't carrying like like we don't see photos of them carrying like loaded weapons against the police or anything like that yeah we see some some violent action they're like breaking some windows i think that matters though uh, i do think the context of uh inciting a violent riot mm -hmm. is something where you know just again regressing to your training they are going to be trained to try to dispel that as quickly as possible well it seems as if the the one in michigan they're carrying they're open carrying they're in your face they're taking over the capitol building that seems like we're causing a big problem and they're not escalating it Right. To the point that we're seeing in Minneapolis. Yeah, I do think that there are two, well, outside of the issues at hand, because I agree with you on the issue side of things. Like when it seems like when there's a fight for greater good, there is a, a big clapback from authority that tries to quiet it as fast as possible and as cleanly as possible, or, or maybe as messy as possible, depending on your outlook. And when there's a fight for uh, privilege or economic issues, it seems like it kind of gets handled through the proper channels of you know, general protest. Mm -hmm. uh, just looking at that, and I, I wasn't privy to any of this prior, so like just looking at the two different differences there, there's a massive schematic difference in the sense that in the second one in Michigan, everybody is wrangled into a small confined space of the Capitol building. Mm -hmm. So in a lot of ways, uh, despite the fact that it looks like it might be posing a larger threat, and especially the fact that like people are open carrying, and that's a problem in and of itself, uh, largely though, the entire protest is kind of like corralled. Whereas in Minneapolis, they're just in the streets, right? And that is a lot more, that, that's, a, that's a bigger setup for harm, I think, right? Because the amount of collateral damage that can be done at the Capitol building is very limited to what's in the Capitol building. Yeah, but Burke, it didn't start in the Capitol building. Like, eventually... Like, I, I'm just it, going off the context of what right, I see. Right, 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 right. I understand. But uh, I'll give you better context. Like, they're definitely outside as well. Mm -hmm. Like, they're, they have they went into the Capitol building at some point, but it, it is not only in the Capitol building. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I completely understand. Like The, it, the, it, it, the it, issue is, is that one looks like a well-formulated... Uh, well, the problem... Uh, the issue problem, however you want to align it. One looks like a well-formulated potential militia, which is a big threat, a huge threat, right? Which one? The Michigan one. Okay. Right. So it looks like an armed militia of sorts mm -hmm. that is attempting to overthrow government. But okay. it's, it's also like at pretty low scale by comparison to something that would actually be able to overthrow. So these, we're going to cut to a couple images of Michigan. So this seems this was like the one going around, you know, the internet for a while where it's like, you know, he's in their face, you know, and it just feels as if like, if, if we look at the context, like at least for me, I'll give my personal opinion. Like it just feels as if this person was not in this, you know, group, let's just say like, yeah, a, the white, a white group. Yeah. Like it, it, this wouldn't be handled like this. At no, least I totally that, agree. It, so, and, you know, here we see, like, more images, like, effectively, like, this is, this is crazy. Like, yeah. this is, like, like, what you're saying. Like, this is a militia, like, gathering together and, like, trying to overthrow. Right. In your opinion, at least, you know, 
if we just turn these people and they're black mm-hmm. and they're open carrying like this legal or not like yeah, right yeah. because some of the yeah. comments and saying like you know it's it's legal like you know to carry in michigan like this even in the in the capital yeah legal or not i don't care this would not be handled no like, I, I, as calmly I wholeheartedly agree. if this if these people were black. i wholeheartedly agree i i, I think that that is speaking to triggers right like what triggers the uh the onset of violence tends to be whatever fear resonates with the person who's about to engage right and largely speaking whenever we're talking about these highly emotional situations where these police officers are regressing to their training yada 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 uh it is just viable that they've been coded to feel more threatened by minority Mm -hmm. than by someone of their own uh skin race sex whatever right so uh by all means i agree with you that from a racial front it's an unlevel playing field period right right uh the point that i was trying to make is just that whenever you are like just out in the open street like that it's impossible it's much more of a mob than a militia correct and that lack of continuity that lack of organization becomes like a ticking time bomb whenever you're talking about two forces interacting with one another because now there is no control over what actions either side is really going to take and that's really problematic with this militia type scenario it's probably a greater threat but it's a standoff at this point in time at least right and i agree with you that uh if if we just flip the switch and we we make that crowd black we may not have had the exact same result but I also think it's that's really, a big problem. Right? It's a huge problem, huge problem. But the but this is what I mean by they say like when we when we protest, you don't listen. I and when we riot, you agree. listen. Right. right. Wholeheartedly agree. Uh, I'm just trying to get into the weeds of it, of where, you know, we don't know. Maybe Michigan law enforcement is just trained better too, mm-hmm. right? So like th- this is the whole thing is I, I I hate that we get caught up in the white noise, of uh, trying to compare apples to apples we can just all acknowledge there's a systemic problem, right? There is systemic racism throughout authority, coast to coast in the United States, period, Mm. right? There is almost no viable way for minorities to have their voices heard in a constructive manner, period. These are the systemic issues that we need to be treating in some sort of capacity, right? And I think we start to lose the point and the focus Whenever we say like uh, a white militia isn't treated with the same scrutiny that uh, a mixed crowd protesting a black issue is treated. It's like, yeah, that's that's absolutely true and the result. But the problem still lies within the systemic racism that's occurring throughout all these authoritative figures. And honestly, it probably all begins in jail. Mm -hmm. Right. It probably all begins with the fact that we've made it okay to just look at certain portions of the country poor like impoverished people people who aren't born into privilege and people of color we've we've been programmed i shouldn't say we because i don't think this is true of the collective but like at least at an authoritative uh standpoint guards uh you know prison uh officers at the prison whatever the whole way up to the top have all kind of like been engaged with this idea that these people were beneath them so now what? If I had that answer, man, we'd have world peace. Like, I don't know. I, I really do think that this is a psychological problem that is a bipart- byproduct of the tribal nature of humans. And, you know, we, we want to say that, like, this is a scary time to be alive in the United States. But it it's not. Right? This is a worldwide issue that has been happening for centuries. Look at the religious wars that are happening between Palestine and Israel, right? Like, the, honestly, this is so crazy. But the root of it all is just privileged pride. It's all ingrained or it all stems from people having some nonsensical pride with them being born a specific way or in a specific place mm-hmm. or to a specific family or whatever the case may be. Like, again, circling all the way back to that video on privilege, it's... It's defining yourself through the pride of all those steps that you got to take forward that weren't earned. What were your thoughts on the Biden kind of saying like, 
If you don't vote for me, you're not black. I mean, I think Biden's a crazy old senile man. And like, I don't know, man. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that type of stuff terrifies me because we end up with four more years of Trump. Mm-hmm. And if you want to try to make the argument that Biden's more racist than Trump, like, good luck. And, yeah. you know, it, it's, again, it's just white noise. It's distracting from the true root cause issues. Like, maybe, systemically speaking, we just don't need a 70-something old fucking white guy running the country. Yeah, maybe. Um, okay. I'm not going to talk about poker, man. Like, I get it. We spoke about poker for the first 35 minutes. Why do they keep wanting me to talk about poker? Just... People want an escape. Yeah, me too. Like, this shitty thing happened. Yeah, me too. I want an escape too, but I can't, you know? I was born in the skin. That's kind of... Yeah. I, I could say that, right? <laughs> I think you're safe. I think you're not safe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So you're saying it's like it's like a, it's a training thing. So I want to close the topic and then, you know, move on into other something else. Um, but you're saying it's a training thing. Um, some well, of the conversations we had, you know, pre-production also said, you know, it was a lot of a training. It's not that I think it's a training thing. It's I think that that's the best place to start, right? Like, we have to incite change somehow. And it's abundantly clear we're not suddenly going to make people less biased, mm-hmm. right? Like, what 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 more can we do? How much more education can there be? Because the fact of the matter is, even if we get it to a point where, like, some small collection of people are are racist or elitist, right? Let's say it's... Let's say we get the population down to 10%. Okay. This is impractical. It's it's not a viable result. But let's say that happens. But of that 10%, a third of them are in authority, right? A third of them are military or police or government officials or whatever the case may be. It just it revamps the spread, mm-hmm. right? Like So like at some point, we have to tactically attack this. And it has to begin at training. There's just... There's no way that that guy wasn't trained in some sort of capacity to disarm a, a, a culprit the way that he did. The problem lies in the fact that he can't discern the difference between a threat and a non-threat. I want to address some comments here. You know, Eric saying, Eric Beck is saying, we can't solve any of this today. You can teach me how to play ace queen off. I promise you this, man. I also can't teach you how to play ace queen off today. You're <laughs> fucking lost. Okay. That's the that's the truth. I need to teach you how to how to construct pre-flop strategies. I need to teach you how to think about EV through moving from flop to turn and river, even pre-flop. I gotta think I gotta teach you about formations. I gotta teach you about bet sizing. I gotta teach you about presence. I gotta teach you about everything that you can't fucking learn today. So sign up for homeschool. It starts in about a week. And uh and you're gonna be okay. But for today, there are bigger there there are some bigger topics than what you, Eric, think about playing ace queen offsuit. Ace queen off is a pretty good hand. If you if you have trouble with ace queen off, good luck with ace jack off, ace ten off, king queen off, king jack off, king ten suited, nine eight suited. Pocket sevens are really tough. You're spicy today, man. Don't don't fucking come here, man. This is season two, man. This is season fucking two. I ain't taking no shit, okay? Unless it's Spotify, right? If Spotify wants to talk, <laughs> you know, I'll. I'll put on my sexy voice with Spotify. You know? Sure, sure. I'll be like, hey, you want to go to the gym? I'll get you a free entry. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get you some free entry. All right. Whew, man. I mean, where do you land on all of this? Like, you know, my my opinion probably doesn't matter that much. I'm just trying to give a logical systemic change. Because it's I, not like, I you think know, those I, of us who are reasonable aren't on the side of this is fucked up. I think that... It starts from the first video where it's like, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's people that are saying like, oh, affirmative action sucks. Like, it's not real. Like, I, I went to school too and things like that. It's like, yeah, you did. And, but like these people as a collective unit are way behind mm. and we have to bring them up. And I get the argument. Like, I get it. It's like, yeah, you went to school, you did your thing and like you couldn't get into Harvard because this person with like slightly worse grades than you got in instead of you because they're black. Kind of like the person getting shut out of the private game. Okay, let's not talk about poker. You're like fucking Eric right now. <laughs> I, I'm just saying I think all of this parallels in some sort of capacity. We all want a meritocracy, but that's not how the world works. Yeah, so what I'm saying is like we have to do something to be able to like bring the people 
that we suppressed up a little bit. Right. Like, and it's like, that's why I think so many people liked Andrew Yang. And it was because like, okay, at least you're giving people a chance. Like they're not suffocating by the fact that they have to like think about the thousand dollars of rent or, and food and kids and all these things. Like they actually have a breathing room where they could actually think about, okay, maybe I'm going to study. Maybe I'm going to, you know, better myself. This thousand dollars is actually giving me a chance. Yeah. And like, I thought about it for a long time. I was like, I was like, okay, if I was giving a thousand dollars, what I, what would I do? And like, I literally thought about, it, I was like, I don't even think I would take it. Like, I think there was an option to just like turn it down. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I would just like, not you, like, I don't need it. I don't need it. So like, at least for now, I won't take it because I don't, I don't want to be like a hypocrite. That's just like, takes it because like, it's free. Cause I was like the whole thing. It's like, Oh, well, what if the people don't need it? It's like, okay, then just turn it down. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think you should still take it but maybe not use it for personal gain. Right. Okay. Maybe like, I'll take it and like do something. Right. You as an individual could probably leverage it better than the assumed government could if it stayed in their hands. Yeah. Agreed. And I think that's fair too. Just effectively, I wouldn't take it and like just put it in my bank account. I get it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that first video was probably, you know, the, the main issue where it's like, okay, there's just a lot of people that are left behind and it's like, it has to just come back to that. And it's like, yeah, I, mean, I, I remember like the, the Bush uh, administration with like no child left behind kind of thing. It's like, okay, maybe that, maybe that failed. Maybe it succeeded well, whatever side you're on. But like at, what, at this point we have to kind of look at it like no human left behind mm -hmm. kind of thing. And it's like, we have to start looking at it like that because, and then like moving that forward. And then as it pertains to, um, you know, George, uh, George Floyd, it was like, that's just not acceptable. Like this person should be fired um and fired he fired should be yeah he should be he should be incriminated life. yeah he's, he's a criminal right like he's this this borders between first and second degree murder correct yeah i i, I completely agree with you it, like fired is not even like that's not enough and i right. think that's where you know i don't think this is going to end because like obviously now this is a national story it's gonna he's gonna be tried there's gonna be more riots there's gonna be more protests it's gonna continue but I feel as if like we need to get to a point where this doesn't just recycle again in another three or four years where it's like, you know, we forget about it. This person maybe goes to jail, maybe he doesn't. And then it just happens again. Like there needs to be like a complete overhaul of like how we're training police officers, like, you know, how we're looking at potential like crimes, you right. know, like, like this person went to sign a check, like maybe the check was bad. Like how does he end up dead? Like yeah. how do we go from there to there? Like yeah. that's not something you end up dead for and it, and i you know i spoke about this today i was on i was on a phone call um and i was like i personally have never like i've never experienced racism mm -hmm. like i've at least i haven't felt it you know and it was because i was born in the northeast where it's like very liberal very uh you know there's just a lot of well a, specifically Spanish. new york is like a, a right lot. right like I, I i was stone's throw away from new york i live like in Jersey where like I could see the empire state building from my window, you know, I saw the twin towers fall from my window. So it's like, I didn't, I've never experienced that. And it's like, there were even things like I came, like I was so out of the loop of racism where like I came here and you know how I talk, I'm just like, yo, what's up, man? Whatever, you know? And like, I was just like, that's nothing. Right. And you're like, whoa, you can't say that. <laughs> and then one time I was like, yo, my eyes are, you know, whatever. You know, like talking about myself, like I was talking about myself and you're like, yo, you can't say that word. And I was like, yo, racism, like, this is a race. Like, I don't even know. Like, I didn't even know these things were racist because I was so out of the loop of racism completely yeah. where it, was, it wasn't even in my, my forecast, you know? But now I'm like, whoa, this is like, this is real. Like there are, there's like people that are racist. People die because of racism. And like, this is just not a thing, you know? Yeah. So it, like racism to me is like, it's ironic because it's like a little, like it's not like it's new to me and in terms of affecting me personally, but yeah, like, but I just see it and I'm just like, this is like not effectively. I don't even see how humans operate like this. That's effectively what I'm trying to say. Right. I, I think that, you know, you touch on a pretty big point there specific to like New York city. And I guess like your, your subsection of Jersey and whatnot, it, it is the biggest community that we have in our nation and it's probably like the most eclectic as far as like pulling from all different races religions uh creeds whatever and 
because of that, people like learn really well how to coexist and live with one another. Mm -hmm. And I think like born out of that is just a lot of empathy for your fellow man. And there becomes a lot of trust and, you know, specifically in like the new New York where uh, it really got cleaned up and Central Park is now like a beautiful place to visit, not really like a crime laden right. uh, drug den or whatever. So I, I think that like figuring out a way to scale that to the point where people's first instinct isn't fear, but instead it's empathy, instead it's trust, instead it's, uh, you know, th just being able to put yourself in the shoes of your fellow man. Like th the biggest thing, and this is crazy because like this is born out of really nothing. Like I shouldn't be afraid of this. One of my greatest fears is to be wrongly accused. Yeah. Right. And it's like, I, I have almost no shot of that happening. Like just being as privileged as I am in this world, it's very unlikely that anything would ever happen where suddenly like I'm up for a murder charge that I didn't commit. Right. Mm. But like I used to lay awake at night, like my teens into my twenties and, and stuff like that. And maybe it's a byproduct of just like having been around shitty scenarios, like seeing drug deals go down yeah. see like people do a lot of scrupulous things that you know that they're on the hook for. Like, man, I can remember being in college and people smoking pot and me just being like, super super freaked out <laughs> that like we were all gonna go to jail and so i was gonna have to like try to explain to them how i wasn't involved not realizing that like it's not a big deal and like these things aren't punishable particularly whenever you're a white male athlete in a college dorm somewhere you know what i mean but yeah i mean like i can't imagine what that would be like to have that burden day in and day out because you are suffering from the crime of being black See some of these. See some of these comments. Chin acts like a typical Dominican. Dímelo, tigre, cómo tú estás? Adiós. Dímelo, cómo tú estás? Tú estás bien. That's right. I am fucking Dominican. <laughs> what you trying to say? That's right. Yeah. A mí me gusta plato con todo. Dámelo todo. Dámelo todo. You heard? They should never give you the comments, man. <laughs> yeah, what's up with that? I am. I am. That's what I am. What you want me to do? You're talking another language, man. I don't know what's going on. We need subtitles. The subtitles would be would be lit on that one. You don't even know. Don't even know. It, would be so, it would be so lit right there. Okay. I want to I wanna try to, uh, you know. This, 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 uh, this whole thing was like, I didn't know if we should take the chance of like doing it. But I was like, you know what? It's a new season. Like, sure. we're just going to fire. I mean, the thing is, is that, like, we have a platform, albeit it's small, albeit it's niche to poker and whatever the case may be, but there's a responsibility that comes with it. Like, I think that we should always be considerate of the information that we are presenting in any capacity. We should always be mindful of the fact that, you know, people are going to agree, disagree. They're going to take things out of context. And uh, even after all of that, we should never be afraid to, like, just put our best foot forward and say what is needed to be said. Oh, I don't care, man. Oh, you I, think Sam Harris is going to skip on this no. topic? No. Of course not. And he also won't tell you how to play Ace-Queen offsuit. How about that? <laughs> All right. I do want to end a little bit on the poker note. So the summer would have... The summer, the WSP, would have started yesterday. And now there is none of that. We've been playing in our rooms, in our respective rooms and our respective platforms you choose one i choose the other mm -hmm. you play on wsop i play on acr and that's all good uh -huh. um yeah i said it i play on acr whatever man come see me chin i am <laughs> um and but you know this isn't gonna last forever like what what is the move like is wsop going to launch uh, something like we like there's some rumors of like they're gonna start a series in a couple weeks or maybe a week well, we a, don't know there's a circuit series that starts next week i think yeah but what about the bracelets man um yeah i mean i think inevitably that's for sure going to happen um i just imagine that it's i i don't know i don't know what to expect right because the liquidity isn't just suddenly gonna triple are people gonna travel to jersey and nevada to play online bracelet events I'm trying to put, I'm trying to put myself in those shoes. Okay, I am 25. Yeah. If you told me I could get a bracelet for 400 bucks online, I think I'm going. Yeah. Like if you lived in Pennsylvania, wouldn't you just go to Jersey? Yeah, for sure. Like 
you would just go to Jersey. If you were from Cali, you would just go to Nevada. Yeah. It's if you live in a... It's everywhere in the middle. Right. And that actually, I think, is a big collection of the money that makes up the poker community. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, is like, you know, we, we've kind of tested this a little bit through marketing and largely the feedback is the majority of the consumers, which by the way, this vlogcast, not going to sit well with them, but the majority of consumers of poker training, and I imagine this translates over into uh, poker players, is white male, late 30s, early 40s, voted for Trump and is a member of the NRA. They love us Dominicans. You heard? <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> so effectively, all this is following is the, uh, this, this is just following the, the money trail, right? The, mm. Basically what it's saying is people with expendable income are the ones to consume training the most. Yeah. And that's no shock. So I think that's also true of those who are willing to play casually or for higher stakes are going to be the ones with the expendable income. So if you're in Montana, are you going to Nevada or Jersey? Does it matter that much to you? Probably like not. not. Yeah. yeah, probably not. Especially play online. Like right, right. You lose the feel of man. Like think about those World Series tables. People don't realize like how diverse they are. Like if nothing else, just the diversity of skill. Right. Like you get everything from. Uh, I remember a couple years ago, the chip leader going into day f three or four of the main event was like a tobacco farmer from the middle of nowhere. We were watching... The, yo, I remember when we were watching uh, your 2020 hindsight. Mm -hmm. It was uh, Darwin Moon. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. was like, damn, Darwin Moon. Yeah, like he's gangster. Dude, if he just wins a flip, he's the main event champ. Right. Like, if he just wins Queen Jack for his nines, like, it's, like he just yeah. cripples Cat, it's over. Yeah, yeah. And then history is rewritten. You know, I was talking about this with Andre a little bit. You know, not to bring it back to race and stuff, but like, I'm probably one of the only Spanish players, like American, like that play poker professionally at like a decently high level. I don't know. I, like, I, I guess think I don't know well enough. I imagine there's a lot of. No, it's like me. Who? I don't know. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's well, no... I'm saying I don't know because there's a lot of grinders that like, I just don't know. Right. There are a lot of people who are just like traveling the circuit. There are a lot of people who are just like playing ignition and yeah. everything else. Like you would know better than me, I guess. Yeah, I know. It's like me and uh the murderer. <laughs> oh, Keith? Yeah, Keith. <laughs> yeah. Me and the murderer. Me, DJ. Like, we kind of like secretly, like we all kind of like look at each other, we're like, Yeah, we made it. You know? <laughs> like like me and DJ Alexander, we look at each other like, Yeah, we we yeah, we out here with these. Like, we out here. <laughs> like Yeah, no, I mean it's it's definitely uh a lack it, it lacks diversity obviously and we we've always known that like we've known that from the male women's side mm -hmm. where it's just like we we certainly have positioned ourselves as a community where we alienate too many people and keep the community small well i've said this for a long time it's not it's not that we don't want to play it's that like we don't have the money to play right like it's like we don't have like you said the, the difference between basketball and golf right exactly it's like can't can't go to the golf course can't go to the golf club you know yeah yeah, yeah. it's like you find a a basket and a deflated ball and you can get your shots up. So what are your hopes for the next, um, let me give you two months. Cause obviously this next month you wiped out of our calendar. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. Uh, it's weird. It's weird to get back to whatever we would clarify as normal at this point. Like phase two starts on Friday. So gyms are going to be, begin to reopen. I think I'm going to hit the gym. I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to gamble. Yeah. I think I'm going to gamble, but I'm going to bring the face max and the gloves. I just need to hit the gym, man. Like, it's not the same at home. No, definitely not. Although, I feel like you've been more consistent and worked harder making it. Like, I think the resistance of having to go out of your way at home has somehow forced you into not slacking. If that makes sense. You're fucked. But go ahead. <laughs> Still don't think I'm fucked. <laughs> not by any stretch. Okay. Um, But, yeah, I mean... I'm I'm starting to personally feel a little bit better. I've been doing a little bit more yoga, so my back feels slightly better, but I don't feel ready. Like I just know the next aggressive thing I do is gonna set me back yeah. the six weeks off. So it sucks because like I'm desperate to get back to the gym. And it's definitely not a COVID thing that's keeping me out. But um yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know what things are gonna look like. Like it just feels like this I don't know. It's it's eerie. It's like Vegas is almost like a little deserted. And obviously yeah. that's not true. There's people everywhere. 
Yeah, but there's like really nowhere to go. There's like, just no event. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no events. There's no like you know, the city's just pretty much built on the strip. Like it, it like right. the strip is like just so it's the heart of the city, and it's like when you remove that, it's just like. Yeah, and I mean, largely that's going to dictate what we can do. We're not going to be able to start opening academies and things like that, running live events, running live streams. You know, we're pretty handcuffed until people get back to playing full ring poker. I don't think I'm going to hit the. I don't think I'm going to hit a a live poker game for a while. Yeah, it just feels. It just. I mean, I don't know, man. Tell, give me my competition first. Like, honestly, it just my, seems if, like if, if you know if I get the call from like it you just know, seems like the air would be like sucked out of the room almost. You know, like I wonder if that cocksucker got me in that game. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I really want to know. I think that cocksucker gave me the game. I mean, maybe at that point, if he wants to play live poker at the Aria, I mean, right. maybe I'll be like, you know, all right, I'll give it a shot. Sure, yeah. sure. Maybe. You can sit behind him, ghost him live. At that at that point, I'm not even a ghost. Right. I'm just like, like <laughs> I'm just there. Yeah. All right, well, go ahead. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, like, uh, it just seems like the air would be sucked out of the room. Like, people obviously still have concerns and fears. Mm hmm. And the data, though, it's coming back pretty positive that we were right initially and high risk groups are the ones that are going to suffer the most and everybody else is largely going to be fine. We also have a lot of data that says we're not going to reach herd immunity and that um, there's a high probability for a second wave. So it's like it's weird. It's weird to put yourself in a situation where like you're at a poker table with six other people or five other people or whatever the case may be and just like make the game desirable enough to be there. A lot of the talk was, okay, now it seems like it should be the time to get online poker moving because it seems as if it's been a big success. You know, the states that have had it have been successful with it. There's also like, you know, if we get regulated online poker through uh, the states, <clears throat> excuse me, there are no sites like ACR. I saw, I saw, you know, the effectively I, I, his name is slipping, but like the lawyer that is, you know, Mac. representing. Yeah. Mac yeah. effectively said like ACR is like blatant, blatantly illegal, mm -hmm. you know, if we get all, if we get regulation, maybe it doesn't happen. I personally, personally for me, I have had a pretty positive experience with ACR. I am not going to like die on their hill. And like, you know, like some of us, you know, Tim Riley out there saying like, yeah, they're fucking great or whatever. I'm going to say like, I've had a positive experience, not saying they're good, not saying that there's not shit that like could be better, that there's not bots. I'm pretty sure there's bots. I'm pretty sure I played against bots. I'm pretty sure I'm good enough to beat those fucking bots too. Because I beat them on the fucking final tables. I know they were bots too. You heard what I'm saying. Um, but like, okay, like, is this the time? Like Burke, is this the time? Like do something. Again, like, I don't think it's a timing issue, right? Like. Just because the market's ripe for the picking doesn't suddenly mean the lobbyists have stopped arguing against online poker, right? Like we're still just in a situation where uh, what's what's preventing the movement from occurring is big business, the guys like days, Sheldon right? Alliston. What was I gonna say? Right here. No, different camera angle. Different camera angle. Different camera. Ang okay, here we go. This is gonna say Spotify. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. Right. It really is. This is what this is why I left it blank. I left it blank <laughs> for for the sponsors. You know, Party Poker, uh, GG, right, right. Spotify, sure. Pittsburgh's Pirates, <laughs> LA Lakers. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Oh, I can promise you, the Pirates aren't going to spend on us, man. You never know, man. You're wearing the colors. You look like you look like you're you're ready to go. You look like you're ready to pitch the ninth inning. I'll do it. You know, glory days. All right, so it's so yeah. Sheldon Addison is doesn't want online poker. That's that's definitely true. Okay, right, and then also like the shared liquidity thing. Uh, it's not a guarantee that uh, just because all the states pass, they'll share. Like that's been the big holdup with California. They don't want to share liquidity with Nevada, but they don't have the infrastructure in place to just start popping up online poker there. So it's like there needs to be a give and take, and until there's some sort of resolution, right? Like from California's standpoint, it's like why would we share liquidity when we can tax it at uh, I think their state tax is like eight or nine percent, something mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. Why would we want to share liquidity and have you guys take that tax revenue away? So it, yeah, I mean, there's a ton of red tape, and I don't think the fact that people are clamoring more for the product matters. Looks like the chat wants a little bit more jungle talk, so we'll give them a little bit more. 
I really don't want to, though. I really don't want to. But okay, fine, fine, fine. He cheated. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he cheated. Everybody knows he cheated. What should we really be concerned is, why don't we give a fuck? Yeah. That, like, I think, is a very fair question. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, he cheated. Why don't we care more? Right. Why don't we care? Why is it just like, oh, fuck it. He cheated. Oh, my God. That sucks. Let's move on now. And, I, you know, I'm playing the $11 nightly today. Well, there's a few reasons. Uh, one of the biggest reasons why the apostle thing impacted the community the way it did is because he preyed upon the the bottom of the ecosystem. Mm. Right? He was preying upon entry-level opponents. Not us. We fucking played 2550. I got fucking rock. Yeah. Agreed. But generally speaking, they were playing like one two one three right. two five 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 whatever, right? So now all of a sudden, this becomes the every man's problem because if those games could be cheated, then any game could be cheated, and that now they have no trust in the community whatsoever. Yada yada yada. So there's a massive separation between jungle and the community. Secondarily, they're playing for infinite money, which the average player can't really relate to. Word. So this sounds like rich people problems, right? And the fact that you're going to tell me white collar crimes exist at a uh, high level leveraged big money spots no shock right so again falls on deaf ears lastly was jungle's apology he's very fucking likable mm -hmm. uh like if you really dig through the apology it's a lot of covering his own ass a lot of blame sharing a lot of uh you know shifting the narrative or kind of distracting to other potential points of issues that could be that could be uh, demonstrated. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, you don't want to think that he's that bad. And this is a gray enough topic where we can kind of just shrug our shoulders and say, the only people who were victims here remain nameless. Perkins won. Mm. So until the other people in the game that were the VIPs who were being exploited come forward and we have some empathy for them, right? Like we need somebody to put a face to. We need to have like Talib come or... uh Jamath. Shamath would be a good example. Um, what? Who am I thinking of? Talib Kweli. No, 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 not the <laughs> rapper. Uh, no, he's he's very good. He plays like a lot of the online high rollers. Mm, oh, uh, Red Raider. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Red uh, like guys like that to come forward and say like, "Hey, we're the ones who Jungle was taking the money from." Mm -hmm. Right now, all of a sudden, we can assign a face to it no longer being a victimless crime. And at that point, then we can start to scrutinize. Right? It's super easy with Possel. Whenever we can point to Marley or Veronica or, you know, the, this host of other people that are just everyday Joes that he's fleecing out of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I feel like there's a little bit of like romanticizing the Robin Hood effect. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, we only took from the rich, so it really doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. And it's like, but if you take from 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 Joe, then right. it's then it's not, not good. You know what Precisely. I'm saying? Yeah, there's definitely some romanticism in, in that. You know, I was listening a little bit to... Uh, his name is Brian Cop Copperman. 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 Yeah. I always forget like the pronunciation. He was on the Thinking Poker podcast. Mm -hmm. It looks like he's a big fan of them, not us. It seems like he's like I don't know, like why he only talked to them for. <laughs> um, but he was on he was on their podcast and he was saying like you know there's a lot of like romanticizing that hustler side. Like you know, we right. spoke a little bit about that, but like that hustler side of poker is like what people enjoy. Like they enjoy like oh yeah he was cheating, but like. You know, like he outwitted them. Yeah, yeah, like he, cheese. yeah, he outwitted them because like he didn't know that I had a little, like I had an ace up my sleeve. You know, I had my man Jungle in the back. You know, telling me like, oh, I know how to play Ace Queen Offset. You heard right. it, right? If you want to learn how to play Ace Queen Offset, maybe you should have uh, my man Jungle Man ghost you. I don't know, man. I'm sorry. I took that tournament down. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, man. All right, so what do you want to talk about, man? You know, we're, we're almost at wrapping up on the cup on the podcast. I, I've exhausted all my topics. I don't know, man. I, I don't I don't want to talk about anything. Like this this was a sad episode for me. I I feel not great really? identifying the problems with the world. I, I feel like not great being or having a platform to take a stance on something where I don't have a logical resolution. I think there is a responsibility for how do I say this? Hmm. Like, if you are a leader of a certain industry, you have a responsibility to speak on the industry. Yeah. And not only the industry in terms of how to make money, 
in how to like s be a strategic thought leader in that industry, but rather also how like the culture of the industry should move forward. Yeah. Right. So we see this a lot with like, you know, you know, whether you like them or not, like Chamath has taken like pretty strong stances on like how like CEOs and things should act, how they should Basically earn money. Ethic. Correct. Heck. Business. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mark Cuban, same thing, Yep. you know? And I think that, you know, whether you want to look at us that way or not, like you have to at least take a stand. You know, I don't like people that don't. Yeah, take no, no, no. I, I, I no, no. I'm not saying wholeheartedly agree. With yeah, you. I'm just saying yeah. I don't like leaders that don't take stands. Like right. I think that's like one of the major things that like people didn't like about Michael Jordan that they like about LeBron James a lot is that Michael never took a stand or anything, mm -hmm. and LeBron takes a lot of stands. Right. And it like people can relate to that and appreciate that. With and like then when people clap back and just say like, oh, just dribble the fucking ball. Like then you you get axed. Yeah. Like, you can't say that. So. It doesn't really matter if like you're in poker or basketball or business or whatever. Like if you are a leader of an industry, you should take a stand because people are looking for you to take that stand. Yeah, no, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I guess like for me, my own personal struggle is uh, I greatly enjoy sol solving problems or at least the process in attempting to. And it's discouraging and disheartening trying to figure out all that plagues humanity and figure out ways that we can better it. Mm. And don't get me wrong. I'm all for that crusade. Like I'd be happy to be one of the ones in the forefront leading the charge. But at the same time, it's just like, it is emotionally exhausting yeah. right? because it's like, I just can't watch a guy die on video. Like I just can't, man. That, that's just like, it's too fucking real. And it's just so permanent. And like, for whatever reason, we just seem to disassociate that in our minds somehow where it's like, yeah, that happened, but people die all the time. It's like, not like that. Statistically. Okay, yeah. fine. But you're not an actuary. So start thinking emotionally, like emotion drives action. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that it's like, everybody should feel a certain way and you should harness that in some sort of capacity. It's translating that emotion into rational action. That is so fucking hard. Yeah. I hope you all enjoyed season two, <laughs> episode number one in the books. Join us next week when we tackle the Middle East. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, I'm hands off. <laughs> I'm regional only. <laughs> My global politics are not up to par. I hope you all enjoyed it. Uh, we will have some segments on poker hands. You know, that is one of the things that we spoke about, you know, going into season two, we will have a little bit, you know, if you are, if you are a fan of like 2020 hindsight, if you like to break down hands, if you like this kind of, you know, back and forth of how to play ace queen offsuit, then we'll have that as well. So tune in next week, subscribe, like, and until next time, stay hard. Thank you.